If you were an ancient Egyptian, you appreciated the bounty of the Nile River. Thanks to the Nile's regular flooding, which made its banks extremely fertile, most of the cities and populations were situated along it. Every year, the Nile would flood and leave behind tons of silt full of nutrients and minerals and all the sorts of things young plants enjoy. You could grow almost anything on and around the banks of the Nile, from wheat to flax to papyrus, which you'll recall from our episode about scrolls. When everything else around you is desert, the Nile was the place to be. So well recognized was the Nile's bounty and the enormous debt Egypt owed to it for their survival that Greek historian Herodotus called Egypt the gift of the Nile. And the ancient Egyptians themselves wrote a song called Hymn to the Nile, all about how it was the bestest river ever and please let's not break up. To them, the river was God himself, and when he was pleased with his people, things went well. When he was not, bad times were ahead. The ancient Egyptians went to great lengths to keep the Nile as happy as possible, and that included sacrificing animals and people to the river itself. Part of the reason Egypt became such a great power in the region had much to do with the Nile itself and the regularity of its floods. When other places in the ancient world were starving because of famine brought about by various climate changes, infestations, and disease, Egypt often found itself with surplus grains and crops thanks to the abundance of its agriculture brought about by the river. Only in Egypt could surrounding kingdoms find relief, and trading became a major part of their economy, while at the same time, many Egyptians could enjoy a life of relative luxury rather than toiling for mere survival. And this trade and luxury encouraged the spread of the Egyptian way of life up and down the river. Their religion and language came to dominate the area, strengthening their position even more as one of the strongest civilizations ever. The Nile even made it possible to transport the bounty of the Egyptian civilization around the kingdom. During the winter, the winds blow up the Nile, making sailing upriver possible and relatively easy. Once upriver, the natural flow of the river would take you back down again with relative ease. And this was all well and good and proper. Except that sometimes the river wasn't quite deep enough to get a boat all the way up from all the way down, or vice versa. Some bits of the river were just too darn shallow to really float a boat laden with cargo all along the entire length. Of course, you could unpack the boat, take it out of the water, find a bunch of people to pack all your goods and the boat around the shallow bit miles further along the river, stick the boat back in the water when it was finally deeper, repack the boat, dismiss and pay all the people, and then continue on sailing to the next bit that was too shallow and repeat it all again. You can see how that might get annoying pretty quickly. And expensive. So naturally, the thing to do was to make the shallow bits deeper, which was exactly what the Egyptians did. Not by digging them deeper and dredging out the bottoms, no. That wouldn't work very well in a river known for the bounty of its silt. Instead, they made the water deeper by impeding its flow and building a dam. Water behind the dam naturally gets deeper until it can overflow the top of the dam. So you just build a dam as tall as you wanted the water to be deep on the upstream side. Do this in all the right places and soon enough you have a Nile River that's deep enough to get a laden boat all the way up. Huzzah! Let trade and commerce commence. Except now you have a new problem. Suddenly there's all these dams all over the river preventing your ships from going up and downstream. You've still got to do the whole unload, remove boat, hire porters, walk around the dam thing. Sure, you don't have to walk as far, but it's still amazingly inconvenient and expensive. Something had to be done, and that something had to mean you could keep your boat and cargo more or less in the water at all times without having to hire huge teams of people to pack everything around so that it was faster, more convenient, and less expensive. What they needed was a lock. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. You'll have heard about all the big important locks, or rather, you won't have heard of all the big important locks, but you will have heard about all the big important canals that the locks are found on. The Panama Canal surely rings a bell, as might the St. Lawrence Seaway, the Erie Canal, and the entire inland canal system of Great Britain. The reason for this 
is that canals are essentially man-made rivers intended to connect one body of water to another. Some connect oceans, like the Panama Canal connects the Pacific and Atlantic. Others connect lakes and natural rivers, like the Erie Canal. And when you, the engineer, decide to connect things up with artificial rivers, sometimes terrain is a problem. And where terrain is a problem, you'll need some sort of lock. The Erie Canal illustrates the problem the Egyptians had with the Nile rather nicely. See, at one end of the Erie Canal is the Hudson River, and at the other is the Niagara River. You may recall something specific about the Niagara River. Niagara Falls, a drop of 167 feet in the course of the river. Which is kind of the thing about rivers. They don't run perfectly straight and level. If they did, they wouldn't really be rivers at all, just long, thin pools of stagnant water. There has to be an elevation change from one end to the other for the water to run at all. Which means, to make a long story short, it's quite the trick to sail upriver in the first place. Now, in the case of Niagara Falls, it's not such a big deal to the Erie Canal, this sudden drop. They can build around that. They still, however, have to deal with an elevation change from one end to the other, Niagara to the Hudson, of about 565 feet over roughly 363 miles of natural river and man-made canal. In fact, at one point near Cohos, New York, the elevation change in that section alone is about 140 feet as the canal climbs the Niagara Escarpment, a geographical feature that Niagara Falls falls down the other side of. You just don't set sail to go up something like that. You have to do what the Egyptians did and build a series of locks. A lock is basically a pool with a way to let water in and out and so change its level. You sail your boat in one end of the lock, close the door and allow water in so that the level rises if you're going upstream, or let water out so the level lowers if you're going downstream. When the water in the pool matches the water level of the direction you're going, you sail out and go on your merry way. There are other ways to do it, but we'll get to those later. The thing the Egyptians and other ancient cultures like the Chinese did was a bit different though. When they built their dams, they thought about how to get boats up and down and came up with a system that, while it worked at least half the time, was pretty devastatingly bad when it failed to work at all. See, they built their dams with holes in the middle of them, which seems an odd thing to do, but they also built a series of panels or paddles that could be fitted into this hole to seal it up and allow the water to rise to navigable level. When a boat needed to go downstream, they could take the paddles out and the boat would be washed downstream with the outgoing rush of water. Which was great, except for three things. One, in order to let a boat upstream, you had to tie the boat to a winch on shore above the dam, take out the paddles, and winch the boat past the dam as quickly as you could before all the water ran out. Two, boats had no control while transitioning from one level to the other. Boats going both upstream and downstream would frequently capsize in the onrush of water, drowning all the people on board and scattering precious cargo all over the riverbed. The third problem was that you would upset all the millers. These flash locks, as they were called, would always result in the same thing. A formerly deep section of river suddenly became too low to run the water wheels millers would set up on the banks, and it would take hours to fill the pool back up to its proper level again. In China, this led to legal battles and sometimes actual physical battles between people trying to go up or down river and millers trying to run their mills. If the water was running particularly low, rivers would be closed to navigation in favor of the milling crowd. It was clearly an increasingly contentious situation, so the Chinese sat down and had a think. Chiao Wei Yu, and we are 100% confident that pronunciation is wrong, thank you very much, was a bit miffed. You see, he was a tax administrator of high rank, and he was sick and tired of all his grain barges sinking on the West River. In fact, things were so bad that some of his people who were supposed to be guarding said barges were conspiring with river pirates to wreck the barges and steal the grain because, hey, what was one more wrecked barge more or less when so many were going down anyway? To put a stop to it, in 984 CE, Wei Yu built a pair of gates across the river, 250 feet apart. By opening one or the other pair of gates, he could let water into or out of the pool created by the gates, called a pound. In effect, he had invented the modern pound lock, whose main advantages were not only better control of the water in and out, but also less water use overall, and the ability for boats to go up and downstream safely. 
and that has been the chief design of most locks ever since. Oh sure, there have been refinements and improvements over the years, but that's the basic function of most of the locks in use today. Boat goes in, gate closes, water changes level, gate opens, and out goes the boat, merrily, merrily, merrily along its way. All done and dusted. However, it's not a perfect system. There's a number of problems that have to be dealt with in some way. One of the biggest is, where does all the water come from? Because the keen-eared listener will have worked out that water doesn't flow uphill, and all the locks require filling and emptying from upstream. In busy canals, you're bound to run out of water eventually, especially if the entire thing is man-made and not connected to a natural river or lake of some sort. If the upstream water runs out, all you have is a trench, not a canal. Every canal has what is called a summit or summit level. This is the uppermost place on the canal, the point from which all water flows into the canal. Clever engineers will do their best to site the canal in such a way that it is fed by a natural continuous water source at its summit level, thus neatly taking care of the problem in a completely natural way. Those that can't avail themselves of this solution can instead do what is called back pumping. Effectively, this takes the water from the downstream end of the lock and pumps it back to the upstream portion, effectively recycling the water and maintaining a constant level above the lock. Side ponds and water-saving basins can also be employed to recycle water so that water taken out of the lock to lower it can be put back in to raise it again. But this is inefficient for a variety of reasons and tends to only save a portion of the water used depending on how many such ponds are in use. In some cases, the inefficiency is so bad as to be not worth the effort, and various side ponds installed along canals in Europe and Britain are now out of use and fallow. As we said before, there are other ways to get a boat up or down a change in water height along a canal. One of the problems, even with a modern pound lock, is that it is time-consuming to use. Depending on the amount of lift, which is rarely more than a few feet at a time, it can take a minimum 15 minutes to fill one lock pound which is not bad in itself, but when asked to go up more than one lock at a time, the investment of time quickly escalates. Locks on especially large changes in elevation can come in groups of three, four, or more, called flights or staircases, depending on how closely they are spaced and whether they share common gates. Passing through these can take several hours, and of course, bigger locks take more time. The Panama Canal has a total of six locks arranged in two flights, three up and three down. In all, the distance across the Panama Canal is 51 miles, but it takes nearly 11 and a half hours to travel it all through the locks. Of course, you wouldn't really be able to try the alternate methods with one of the massive Neo Panamax ships. Specifically designed to exactly fit the maximum allowable dimensions of Panama Canal usage, they barely clear the sides of the Panama locks and carry about 120,000 tons of cargo. So it's unlikely you could use the inclined plane system for ships of that size and tonnage. Not without some serious work that swiftly turns impractical and expensive at that scale. Just as its name suggests, the inclined plane system uses an inclined plane at the site of the dam or other elevation change to raise and lower boats by bodily lifting them out of the water and up a slope to the next level of the canal or river. The ship sails into a cradle made, depending on size and weight, of wood or other suitable material. The boat or ship is strapped to the cradle to ensure it stays in place, and then the whole thing is winched or towed up or down an inclined track until it reaches the intended level where it is released from the cradle and goes on its way. In all, a practiced crew can be underway in as little as five minutes depending on the amount of lift required. Improvements on the inclined plane include using caissons instead of cradles. A caisson is basically a big tub of water you sail the ship into. There are usually two in use, one at the top and one at the bottom of the track. Because the weight of each ship and caisson arrangement is carefully managed, they act as counterweights to one another, reducing the amount of mechanical effort needed to change elevations by letting gravity do the work of bringing the heavier upper caisson down while lifting the lighter lower caisson. Once each ship has reached the appropriate level, the caisson gate is opened and the ship sails out. The advantage to the inclined plane system is, of course, that it does away with the need to build multiple locks to traverse the same change in elevation. Pound locks typically only lift a few feet at a time, 
due to needing to manage the water used to fill and empty the pound. Other than what water might go in the caissons to float the vessel, no other water is needed. And inclined planes can raise any height you like, provided you have the land and space to run the track on. So you automatically cut out the time you'd otherwise use to fill or empty the locks, and the volume of water needed to do so to go the same distance. Time to cross a large change in elevation goes down to minutes instead of hours. Other types of locks have been proposed over the years. The caisson lock, for instance, takes a caisson as described above, and instead of raising it along the tracks outside the lock, takes an entirely sealed caisson with a boat closed up inside and lowers or raises it through the lock itself. A boat would enter the caisson at the top of the lock, the whole thing would submerge and pass to the bottom of the lock, a door would be opened and the boat let out again to the lower waterway. Sort of a whole underwater boat elevator, if that helps you picture it. The problem was, of course, that by the time the boat, enough water to float it and the caisson got to the bottom of the lock, it was under three atmospheres of pressure being some 60 feet underwater, which presented difficult engineering problems that weren't really worth the trouble to solve when compared to the cost of solving them. None were ever built past the testing phase. New proposals for locks and various mechanisms are cropping up all the time. For instance, the diagonal lock, which consists of a diagonal shaft with a watertight door at the bottom and regular lock gates at the top. Sail in, close the door at the bottom, let the shaft fill with water, and sail out at the top. Every so often along the length of the tube would be side ponds designed to conserve water, and any given boat would ride with a set of what are essentially floating bumpers to keep it off the sides of the tube, but they expect it would save a lot of time and money because it has so few moving parts. Though, as yet, no one has actually built one. But as amazing as all that sounds, no lock can really hold a candle to the world of boat lifts. Let us explain. In England, the River Weaver and the Trent and Mersey Canal system nearly met. In 1734, the River Weaver navigation, as it was called, had been completed, allowing for the transport of a very important commodity. See, under the Cheshire countryside were enormous rock salt beds, and so, ever since Roman times, various salt towns arose, primarily focused on exploiting those salt beds. You can pretty well tell where these mines were by looking at a map of England and noting where all the towns ending in which are, since the suffix which means salt pit. Once the river Weaver was all set to go, the salt started to flow down river as it was transported and distributed around the country from there. And so, much money changed hands, and many people suffered only a little from high blood pressure for many years. In 1777, the Trent and Mersey Canal opened, and suddenly a second route of transport and distribution existed that not only ran further south than the Weaver into the important coal mining and pottery industries around Stoke-on-Trent, but also very nearly but not quite connected up to the entire River Weaver navigation. It's that not quite that's the problem bit. See, there was a small matter of a 50-foot tall escarpment at Anderton to reckon with. The Weaver sat at the bottom of it, and the Trenton Mersey at the top. A lot could have happened. The two different companies operating the canal and the river could have had a right proper dust up over the whole thing, with much scheming and sneaking about, and basically being a pair of dick dastardlies. It had happened before, and was in fact happening in many other parts of the country where profitable potentials were being latched onto by the other guy and not at all anyone on the home team. Instead, the folks of the Trenton Mersey and the folks of the Weaver Navigation decided that the real way to make real money was to work together. So they did. Each built right up to the escarpment and each ran water all the way to the edge. By 1793, they'd built two cranes, two salt chutes, and an inclined plane to transport goods up and down the escarpment to boats on one or the other waterway. By 1831, the Anderton Basin had two sets of almost everything, and business was good for both parties. But goodness, it all took a long time to do all this shifting of goods and materials between the two waterways. And as we all know, time is money. In 1870, enough was enough. The Anderton Basin had become a major interchange, and three double inclined planes and four salt chutes just couldn't keep up and were very expensive to maintain. They needed a way to connect both waterways so boats could just go straight on through. 
So what they decided to do was construct the Anderton boat lift. After years of design, consultation, approval, and construction, the boat lift was completed in 1875 at a cost of about 4.5 million pounds in today's money. That's roughly 5.6 million quatloos for the Americans in the audience. The Anderton boat lift is essentially a hydraulic elevator. A boat at the top on the Trenton Mersey side navigates along a cast iron aqueduct and into a water holding caisson at the top of the lift. The caisson sits atop a single large hydraulic piston which slowly lowers the boat as a similar caisson rises on the other side from below. Both pistons are connected beneath the water, allowing water to flow from one piston cylinder to the other, counterbalancing each other. Virtually everything, as originally constructed, was made of cast iron. The aqueduct, the caissons, even the pistons. And it worked beautifully. Boats could ride up and down in the lift in as little as three minutes, a vast improvement over the loading and unloading times needed before. Which was a real shame when things started to corrode and break down, somewhat predictably due to rust. Eventually, the whole thing had to be shut down and converted to an electrical system of weights and counterweights when one of the caissons unexpectedly lost pressure and sank all the way from the top of the lift to the bottom in a move that surprised many but injured no one thanks to the gradual rather than rapid decrease of water pressure. It ran for years as an electrical system before that too became too corroded to be trusted any further and the whole thing was shut down at last in 1983. Eventually though, 7 million pounds was raised to restore the boat lift in 2002 and it operates again today under its original system, modified to work with hydraulic fluid rather than plain old water. But that's not the only or even the most amazing boat lift ever made. No, no, no. We figure that has to go to the Falkirk Wheel, which sits between Scotland's Forth and Clyde Canal and the Union Canal. It's a 100-foot revolving wheel that was built as part of an effort to improve the connections between 16 communities in the Falkirk district. The whole improvement project was called the Helix and also featured a sculpture called the Kelpies, which looks a lot like two giant horse heads sticking up out of the ground, but is still really cool. The wheel itself is made up of two caissons that orbit a central axis which rotates to simultaneously lift one caisson and lower the other. Designed to look like a double-headed Celtic axe, it is a marvel to behold and the only one of its kind in the world. We thought you'd get a real lift out of that. This has been the GM Word of the Week podcast, and thanks for lending us your ears for the last few minutes. Hopefully, we've returned them to you undamaged and full of information. If your ears haven't been returned to you, I really don't know what to tell you. Probably they were delayed in the post. You know how these things are. Just be patient. If you've enjoyed these episodes so much that you just don't know what to do with yourself, may we suggest heading over to gmwordoftheweek.com and following the yellow banner at the top to join our Patreon, wherein you will be provided all manner of early releases, transcripts, and such like things. It's worth noting that we have a bonus episode coming out this week, and even I'm going to be surprised by whatever it turns out to be about. So get in while you can. This episode has been researched, written, produced, and sent over the falls in a barrel by Brian Casey. Music for this episode is provided by Blue Dot Sessions. I don't know what you expect here. Just how many quotes do you think there are about canal locks? <laughs>